Okay, so where we left off was with the polar plot. So we'll start with a polar plot again. So remember, a polar plot essentially combine all the, the segments. So you, the 17 is the, the, the apical cap, okay? The apical cap is uh, 17. And then just outside of the apical cap, you have the apex, okay? the apex and remember the apex you divide that into four segments you have the anterior segment inferior segment lateral segment and this the, the septal segment okay then just outside of the apical uh just outside of the apex you have the mid level mid okay and then the mid level is divided into six segments. You have an anterior segment, inferior segment, the lateral segment is divided into an anterior lateral and an inferior lateral. The septal, uh, the septal wall is divided into anterior septal and an inferior septal. And then you have the basal, uh, the basal uh, area. And that's divided into six segments as well. So you have your anterior on top, inferior at the bottom. Then the lateral is an anterior lateral. You have your inferior lateral. In the septal, you have your inferior uh, septal, septal, and then the anterior septal. So you have to be able to uh, label the, the, the segments. and if you look at um, reporting on, on uh, you know, echo reporting, a lot of echo reporting going to give you the reporting in a polar plot. I know, the, you know, those of you who also look at um, nuclear scan reports, they give it to you also in a polar plot, and it means the same thing. So you have to know how to identify the segments. What we do in echo we will if the segment is normal we'll put a one and we color code it usually green if it's uh, hypokinetic it, then we'll put two if it's akinetic three if it's dyskinetic four and aneurysmal put five and we have a color code for each of those uh, scores so a lot of time you can just look uh, the color on the polar plot and say exactly what is happening and where it's happening. So be familiar with that. But more importantly, um, you can deduce the, 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 the blood vessel that is involved in the disease process. Usually, when you have the anterior and the anterior septal being involved, it's usually the LAD, the LAD. And then where you have the lateral, uh, it's usually the left circumflex. And the, the, the inferior is usually the right coronary artery. Uh, sometimes it varies a little bit, but generally speaking, that the, uh, the blood vessel uh, distribution. Uh, so, so, Let's look at let's look at the apex. So when you look at the apex of the heart, remember it's four segments, and okay. So the the blood vessels are color coded um, on the left. So the anterior and the septal and the apex is usually the LAD, LAD, and then the lateral is usually. The circumflex or a branch of the LAD, we call that the diagonal. So the diagonal, which is a branch of the LAD, and the circumflex, usually lateral. And then the inferior is um, usually the RCA. So what you should try and do is keep it simple. So, you know, the anterior and the septum, probably LAD lateral circumflex, I mean, and then the inferior RCA. And then when you get to the mid-level, the lateral, again, is a branch of the LAD, 
and the circumflex lateral, the, the, anterior, the anterior septum, the LAD, and then the inferior, uh, the inferior and inferior septum is usually the RCA or some branches of the RCA, okay? And then for the basal level, again, the lateral is usually the circumflex or a branch of the LAD, and the, the anterior and the anterior septal is usually the LAD, okay? And then the inferior septum, inferior is your RCA. So, you know, you can just keep it simple. You know, lateral is probably usually the circumflex, the anterior, anterior septal LAD, and then the inferior is usually the RCA. And then when you look at your apical views, okay, you see you have the septum and the lateral wall. The lateral wall is usually the, the, the circumflex or the a branch of the LAD, the diagonal. And the septum is, you know, the, the apical septum, usually the LAD. And then when you talk about the, the, the mid and the basal septum, uh, the RCA. Okay. And then this is your two chamber view, the anterior is always the LAD, and then the inferior, mainly the um, RCA, and you know, the apical, uh, the inferior apical, or apical inferior wall is usually the, um, the LAD. And then your, your apical tree chamber view, or long axis view, this is your anterior septum, usually the LAD, and your inferior lateral, usually the circumflex or the RCA. All right, so just have a, 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 a very simple approach to it. Don't try and get bogged down into details. I mean, you know, because when if in the exam they they're gonna they're gonna keep it simple in the exam. So you have to know the coronary flow distribution and the left ventricular segmentation is important. So you have the heart, the right coronary artery comes off the right coronary cusp and it travels to the right side of the heart and it gives off branches. And then the left main coronary artery comes off the left coronary sinus and it uh, gives rise to the LAD which travels in the front and then the left circumflex which uh, travels to the back of the heart. So, you know, when we did the anatomy, you know, there's a reason. So you need to know that. You need to know the blood supply to the heart. Uh, we did that. All right. So the coronary flow distribution and left ventricular, segment, uh, ventricular segmentation. The, anat the anatomic variability regarding coronary artery blood, uh, blood supply is important. However, based on the most common anatomy and um, current guidelines, you're going to assign each segment to one of the coronary artery as follows. And then, you know, so these are the number, the numbered segments which tell you exactly where they are and the LAD supply that area. Then the numbered segments, the right coronary artery and the, the numbered segments and left circumflex. So you can just look at it and work it out. Okay. As I said, they're gonna be variations, but just keep it simple. The anterior, anterior septal LAD, lateral more than likely the, the circumflex, probably a branch of the LAD, the inferior or inferior septum, usually the RCA. They're going to be variations. Don't get bogged down in the variations, right? Um, so segment eight, which is the mid inferior septal, it could be the right coronary artery or the LAD. Uh, but again, don't get bogged down in the, um, in the details, but you need to have a, a you need to have a, a an idea, you know, what what uh, blood vessel is involved. You know, majority of the time you'll be correct. In the minority of uh, instances, you're gonna be incorrect, but that's okay. But it's very important, especially for those of you who actually see patients, 
with 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 with, with uh, acute coronary syndromes because if you if you can identify the segment that is abnormal that's hypokinetic or akinetic you can uh you can infer which blood vessel is is occluded and you can plan your strategy accordingly so this morning we're going to we're going to start Doppler echocardiography. As I pointed out before, echo is essentially, I mean, majority of echo is Doppler. Majority of, you know, cardiac uh, ultrasound is Doppler because we get so much information from the Doppler and, you know, it's critical for us to make certain assessments. Uh, you know, when we use the Doppler, we, we, can, we, can, we can determine gradients. That is the, the pressure difference between areas. We can, we can determine valve area, which is crucial to echo, because we can, we can tell the surgeons when to, to intervene in terms of operating an, uh, on, on an individual patient because the valve area is critically narrowed. Um, a long time ago, that, were, that, you know, that wasn't the case. Someone who have a valvular, say a valvular stenosis, they had to go to cardiac cath to determine the severity of the, the, the valvular stenosis. To the that's that's the opposite, you know, it's opposite to what we did 20 years ago. We do the echo and we determine the severity of the valvular stenosis. We'll send the patient to cardiac cath, but that's just to look at the blood vessel around the heart because if you're going to fix the valve, if the patient has blockage of the blood vessel around the heart, then you've just fixed that as well instead of taking the patient at a later time back to have open heart surgery. So that's the only rational uh, today for doing a cardiac catheterization is to look at the coronary anatomy. So Doppler is crucial to echo. So you have to understand Doppler. You have to understand it fully, okay? What we're gonna do, we're gonna discuss the Doppler effect. We're gonna look at the Doppler shift formula. We're going to look at a few spectral recording, that is, you know, what type of, um, uh, of envelope we get when you do Doppler. So, how, so essentially what we're looking at is the velocity as it relates to time. How does the velocity shape uh, varies with time? Okay, that's a spectral recording. The, there are three types of Doppler that we're going to look at. Um, we're going to look at pulse wave Doppler. Uh, it's called PW. We're going to look at continuous wave Doppler, which is called CW, and then color flow Doppler, which is a form of pulse wave Doppler. Okay. We're going to mention as well tissue Doppler. Tissue Doppler is a form of pulse wave Doppler, and we're going to define these different um, Doppler. Anyway. Uh, the Doppler effect was first proposed by the Austrian physicist Christian Doppler in 1842. And what he observed is you know, it's a, a very simple uh, phenomenon. So he was at a train station, and um, when the train was approaching and the horn was uh was 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 bleeping so the, the the train was approaching when the train approached him and the horn was going he perceived an increase in the intensity of the sound but when the train passed and went by him the the the, 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 the perceived intensity of the sound decrease, which is, you know, it's not, I mean, for now, it's not a great 
discovery because it is it, something that we encounter um, every day, you know. So what he, what 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 he, he so what he wrote down is that um, an approaching uh, a moving sound when it comes when it's coming towards you, the perceived frequency increases. And when it move away from you, the perceived frequency decrease. The actual, the actual frequency, because if you if you think about it a little bit in detail, when the train is approaching, when the train approach you, the the and the horn is going, the the frequency of that sound is gonna be fixed. It's not gonna change, but because the, the 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 source of the sound is moving towards you the perceived frequency is you you perceive the frequency to, to, to be higher or greater and when it move away from you you perceive the frequency to be decreased or to be less so the actual frequency of that sound is not changing what is changing is the moving source of the sound. When it's moving towards you, you perceive the frequency to be higher. When it moves away from you, you perceive the frequency to be less. So the, the only thing that varying is the, the moving source of sound and the, the perceived frequency. So that is essentially the Doppler effect. And if you say this this red button is, is is you at the train station, okay? When the say this the the, the um if 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 this if this red button is you at the train station, when the 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 train is coming towards you, okay? The frequency. Uh, the frequency appears to be increasing. Okay, so you you see the wavelength sort the, the wavelength is short, and you have the bunch of uh, waves that bunch up together. So this suggests that the frequency is increasing. Okay, remember when wavelength is short, frequency is high. They, they are usually fixed, but when the train passes and move away, the wavelength increases. The frequency decrease okay so that's the Doppler effect so when an object is moving towards the transducer so now we have to relate this to ultrasound so our ultrasound is uh, our probe sorry the probe is like the observer at the, tr the train station and then you have the, the moving blood so the moving blood, it may be traveling towards the transducer, which is essentially the observer, or it may be moving away from the transducer. So remember, when we do Doppler, we're looking for motion. That's what Doppler detects motion, and you're going to get a plot of velocity uh, against time. Okay, so the moving blood, it may be coming towards the transducer or moving away from the transducer. So when an object is moving towards the transducer, usually, well, say it could be blood or, or, or tissue, the frequency observed is higher than the transmitted frequency. So that's what Doppler uh, Christian Doppler, uh, I'd, I'd observe at the train station. So when the blood is when blood is moving towards the transducer, the observed frequency or the perceived frequency is higher than the transmitted frequency. The 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 the, the ultrasound probe is going to send out a fixed frequency. That frequency that the ultrasound probe is sending out is not going to change. It is the observed or the perceived frequency, okay? And then when, when an object is moving away from the transducer, the frequency observed is lower 
than the transmitted frequency. So if, if the blood is moving towards the transducer, you're going to get a higher frequency. If it's moving away from the transducer, you're going to get a lower frequency. Just like the observer at the train station. So when you look at the, the Doppler shift formula, we have delta F, which is really the, the, the Doppler shift. Okay, This is the received frequency or you can call that the observed frequency or the perceived frequency, okay? So this is the thing that's gonna vary, the received frequency. The transmitted frequency is a fixed uh, number because the, the ultrasound probe is sending out <clears throat> a fixed frequency, two megahertz or whatever it is, it's gonna be fixed. Just like when the, the, the train is approaching the observer at the station, the, the, the horn is going, the horn, that horn is you know, gonna send out a fixed frequency. But when it approach, when the train approach an observer, that observer perceive the frequency to be increasing as the train approaches. And then the, 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 the Doppler shift is a, it's a shift in the frequency. So the, Receive frequency minus the per uh, the transmitted frequency. That's the Doppler shift. And there's a formula. This formula is very important. So the this is a Doppler shift formula. So it is two times the transmitted frequency. This is the velocity of the moving blood minus the uh, cosine of th uh, theta which is the angle the ultrasound beam makes with the moving blood, okay? Cosine of theta, and it's divided by the velocity of sound in blood, okay? The velocity of sound in blood. Remember the velocity of sound in soft tissue is a fixed number, okay? And I would say theta is the angle between the, the ultrasound beam uh, from the transducer and the moving red blood cell. So this is what it's gonna look like. So this is your ultrasound probe right here. If, if, the, if, if the blood is moving towards the transducer, the, 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 the perceive or the receive frequency gonna appear to be increased. And we usually put increased frequency as a decreased wavelength and a bunching up of the wave. Because increased frequency mean more cycles per second. So this is how you represent it, to increase frequency. As opposed to if the blood is moving away from the transducer, the received frequency is gonna be reduced and we represent that by increasing wavelength or a less, a reduced number of cycle per second, okay? So moving towards the transducer, the perceived frequency or receive frequency is higher. Moving away, it's lower. Doppler is very important to us in, in, in echo, but one of the limitation of Doppler is this angle theta. It is angle dependent. So if you give me a poor study, I'm gonna make all sorts of wrong assessment diagnosis on the patient. That is why doing a proper echo is so important because you can mess up on the diagnosis. You know, if the patient in actuality have a, a valve area of say 0.6 centimeters squared, the aortic valve area 0.6 centimeters squared, which is critical. Patient probably should go to surgery if they're symptomatic. And if you don't pay attention to your angle theater and you give you you messed up and you in in the calculation you get a valve area of 1.2 you might think that the symptom is related to something else not the the valve area because 1.2 is not critical so doing an accurate study is important okay because of this angle theater doppler is angle dependent you want to get your ultrasound beam very, almost parallel to your moving 
our, our blood. So you want to get this angle theta close to zero because if you look at your formula, you have your 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 the the the, the frequency is uh, two times your transmitted frequency. Uh, time the velocity of the, the moving uh, blood times cosine theta. Remember, cosine, cosine of zero is one. So if, if, if your ultrasound beam is parallel to the moving red blood cell, theta is zero. So cosine of zero is one. As opposed to if you are perpendicular to the moving red blood cells, then theta would be 90 degrees. Cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So the less parallel you are to the moving red blood cell, the more hero you're going to encounter. You want to get your ultrasound beam as parallel to blood flow as possible when you're doing Doppler because cosine of zero is one. You'll get your maximum Doppler shift if you if the ultrasound beam is parallel to the blood flow because you're looking at your your cosine of the angle okay you want to get your ultrasound beam parallel to blood flow if it's parallel then theta is zero and if you substitute zero there cosine of zero is one maximum Doppler shift, maximum velocity. Okay, very important. If your ultrasound beam is perpendicular, then you're not gonna get any Doppler shift whatsoever. You're not gonna get uh, any velocity, okay? So Doppler, the, the limitation of Doppler, it is angle dependent angle dependent all right so when we look at our spectral velocity recording if there is flow towards the transducer it gonna give you a, a spectral display above the baseline and we will we will we'll go over that so if blood is flowing towards the transducer the ultrasound probe you're going to get a spectral display above the baseline. Okay? Um, and it, it, that's a positive, it, it's a positive or, or upward shift in the velocity. So it's above the baseline. So flow velocity towards the transducer is displayed as a positive or upward shift in the velocity. So it's going to be above the baseline flow velocity away from the transducers is, the, is displayed as a negative or downward shift in the velocity. So this is what we mean. So you, this is your ultrasound probe or transducer. If the blood is flowing towards the transducer, this is the baseline, you're going to get a positive velocity. It's going to be above the baseline. If the blood is moving away from the transducer, this is your baseline, it's gonna be below the baseline, or a negative velocity, okay? Very important. So, this, if you remember what we did earlier, this is a short axis at the level of the aorta. The aorta is right there, tricuspid valve is right there, and your pulmonary valve is right there. Our cursor, is across the tricuspid valve. If you have blood flow, this is your transducer. So you, you have to know where your transducer is located. This symbol represents your transducer. This symbol is your transducer. And you, this is your two-dimensional echo. Short axis at the level of the aorta. Aorta is right there. Tricuspid valve is right there. Pulmonic valve is right there. Your, trans, your cursor is across the tricuspid valve. Blood is moving from the, 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 the right ventricle, or right ventricle flow track. Blood is moving from the right ventricle across the tricuspid valve 
into the right atrium. Okay, it's moving away from the transducer. So when you have tricuspid regurgitation, blood moves from the right ventricle across the tricuspid valve into the right atrium. Okay, the normal flow of blood would be from the right atrium across the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. But if you have tricuspid regurgitation, the blood is going to move in the opposite direction. It's now going to move from the right ventricle across the tricuspid valve into the right atrium. So it will be moving away from the transducer, which is right there. So blood will be moving in this direction. This is your Doppler. So it's, you're doing Doppler. So you, you put... Uh, you put your uh, cursor, your, your what we call the sample volume right there, and you press your Doppler button. And this is your ECG. Remember, everything in echo is gated. And you get these spectral envelopes. OK? There's a pattern to, to the spectral envelope. You in systole, with systole is from the onset of the QRS to the end of the T wave onset of QRS to the end of the T wave, onset of QRS to the end of the T wave, you get these systolic envelopes, systolic envelopes, which is tricuspid regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation. It's below the baseline. This is the baseline right there. It is below the baseline because the flow is moving away from the transducer. Transducer is right there. The blood is flowing from the right ventricle across the tricuspid valve into the right atrium. Tricuspid regurgitation. This C doubler means continuous wave Doppler. We didn't use pulse wave Doppler. And later on in the lecture, we'll tell you why we use C doubler. We'll to give you the difference between C doubler and P doubler. But anyway, the spectral envelope is below the baseline. This is the baseline right there. It's below the baseline because the flow is away from the transducer. Transducer is right there. OK. As opposed to this scenario, your two-dimensional echo is on top. Your transducer is right there. Okay, it's an apical four chamber view, curses across the mitral valve. Okay, the cursor is across the tricuspid valve. The sample volume is right at the tip of the mitral leaflet. We know that the normal flow of blood is from the left atrium across the mitral valve and into the left ventricle. The normal flow of blood is from the left atrium across the mitral valve into the left ventricle. And this occurs in diastole. So in diastole, we have blood flowing from the left atrium across the mitral valve into the left ventricle. It is moved, the blood is moving towards the transducer, which is right there. So you're going to get a spectral display above the baseline, above the baseline. And in diastole, you're going to get that. Systole is from the onset of the QRS to the end of the T wave. Diastole is from the end of the T wave to the QRS. So in diastole, you get a flow above the baseline, flow above the baseline. And you can see that this flow is repeating itself in diastole because the flow is towards the transducer. This is P doubler. And later in the lecture, we'll tell you why in this case we use P doubler. When we're looking for tricuspid regurgitation, we use C doubler. OK? But the important thing is to know that flow towards the transducer is going to give you a, a spectral envelope above the baseline. Flow away from the transducer is going to give you a spectral envelope below the baseline. So this is your uh, 
if you you know this is your Doppler shift formula that you're familiar with, and we tell you the angle theta is the angle theta is very important. You want to get flow uh, or your ultrasound beam as parallel to blood flow as possible. That's going to give you maximum velocity, and your calculation will be valid, will will be accurate. As opposed, if you if you're not parallel and say you're very close to 90 degrees, you're going to get the minimum, very minimum velocity and your calculation is going to be inaccurate. So when an ultrasound beam is parallel to the blood flow, theta is zero, cosine of zero is one, thus the maximum velocity or true velocity. Well, the, when the ultrasound beam is perpendicular to the blood flow, angle theta is 90 degrees and cosine 90 is zero. Thus, the velocity will be zero. So you can, you know, you can do a Doppler across, say, your mitral valve, looking for mitral regurgitation. And if you're perpendicular to the flow, you'll see no flow. Doppler is angle dependent, so you have to pay close attention to how you're doing your scan. Always assess Doppler in multiple windows to get the most parallel beam to blood flow and then the maximum velocity. What this statement is saying is that whenever you're doing any type of Doppler study across any structure, you have to do you have to use multiple windows because you're actually looking for the most parallel ultrasound beam to blood flow. And if you're just, if you're accustomed to doing it in just a couple of windows, that might not be the window that gives you the most parallel ultrasound beam to blood flow. So multiple windows to get that, uh, that parallel ultrasound beam to blood flow. Now we come on to, we come to, to the different types of Dopplers. So one type of Doppler is pulse wave Doppler, affectionately called PW. PW or pulse wave Doppler. Pulse wave Doppler measures velocity of blood at a single point. Okay? The transducer actually sends out signal and then wait for the reflected signal to come back. So it's sending out impulse, wait, and, and, and waiting. So it's sending, waiting, waiting. So it's a, it, you know, by doing that, it, it, it can only measure low velocities, okay? Because it's, it's sending out impulse and then waiting for that reflected uh, wave to come back and then it uh, tabulate the frequency. Uh, so the tran that same trans the, the, the transducer alternates between transmission and reception of the ultrasound. Okay, pulse wave Doppler can only measure low velocity flow or low velocity uh, movements. We use pulse wave Doppler to measure mitral inflow velocity because it's low velocity. We use it to measure left ventricular flow track. Velocity, hepatic vein velocity, tissue Doppler imaging, pulmonary vein flow, and tricuspid inflow velocity. You have to know what scenario you're going to use pulse wave Doppler, and then what scenario you'll use continuous wave Doppler. Okay? So pulse wave Doppler we use for low velocity scenarios, mitral inflow, left ventricular flow track velocity, hepatic vein velocity, tissue Doppler imaging, pulmonary vein flow, tricuspid inflow velocity. So anywhere you have motion, any type of movements, Doppler can fully assess that, 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 that movement and motion. So that's all we're doing. We're just using our Doppler to assess movement of, say, blood across a structure, the movement of tissue 
It's very important. But if the velocity is a slow one, if the velocity is a slow one, we, we, we can use pulse wave Doppler. Remember that color flow Doppler is a form of pulse wave Doppler. Tissue Doppler imaging, which is huge because this, when we're doing, when we're assessing diastolic problem, if you're gonna, if you're gonna assess diastolic function, you have to do tissue Doppler imaging. What tissue Doppler imaging is, you know, you, 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 we, we want to look at the velocity of the, 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 the tissue. We want to look at the velocity of the muscle. Remember, the heart moves. And if the heart is not moving properly, it suggests that there is a problem. So we can use Doppler to see if that muscle is moving normal or it's abnormal. And that's what we call tissue Doppler imaging. Okay. All right, so again, our mitral inflow velocity, it's a pulse wave Doppler assessment. Two-dimensional echo is on top. Your cursor is right there. Sorry, your, 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 uh, your ultrasound probe, this is the probe or the transducer. Probe or transducer is right there. This is your cursor. The sample volume is across the mitral valve. Sample volume is across the mitral valve. We know that normal blood flows from the left atrium across the mitral valve into the left ventricle in diastole. It's a, it, it's a low velocity flow. Your ECG is on top. Diastole is from the end of the T wave to the QRS. So in diastole, you have these flows. Okay? This is the mitral inflow. The mitral inflow, um, if you remember, we talk about the first, the first, uh, the first aspect of uh, of diastole is your IVRT. So your IVRT, isovolumic relaxation time or period, and then the mitral valve opens, and you have rapid suction of blood across the mitral valve into the left ventricle, giving rise to your E velocity. Then you have a diastasis where you have equalization of pressure between the left ventricle and the left atrium. Then atrial contraction to give you your A velocity. Okay, so you have your E, e velocity and your A velocity. E velocity, A velocity. Mitral inflow velocity mitral inflow velocity. The velocity is on the vertical axis, time is on the horizontal axis, okay? It's a pulse wave Doppler. Pulse wave Doppler usually cannot measure more than 1.5 to, to, to maximum two meters per second velocity, okay? This is our left ventricular flow track velocity. Two-dimensional echo is on top. This is your transducer right there. Cursor is across the left ventricular flow track. Okay. The sample volume is just outside of the aortic valve. This area is the left ventricular flow track. Blood is flowing from the left ventricle across the left ventricular flow track, across the aortic valve, into the aorta. It's moving away from the transducer. And it's below the baseline, okay? And this is also a PW measurement, pulse wave Doppler measurement. PW measurement, okay? Blood is flowing from the left ventricle, across the left ventricular flow track, across the aortic valve into the aorta, and you get an envelope because it's moving away from the transducer, you get an envelope below the baseline. It's a systolic flow. A blood flow across the left ventricular flow track, aortic valve in systole. So it's from the onset of the QRS to the end of the T wave. Onset of QRS, end of the T wave. So this, 
this spectral or, or Doppler envelope is left ventricular flow track uh, flow or velocity, okay, below the baseline, and you know why it's below the baseline. This velocity is usually one meter per second or less, and that is why we use pulse wave Doppler, pulse wave Doppler. This is our hepatic vein flow. So when you do your subcostal view, subcostal view, you know your IVC, inferior vena cava, drains into the right atrium. The hepatic veins, the hepatic vein drain into the IVC. It's actually moving away from the transducer. So this is your baseline. ECG is on top. So in systole, you get a systolic flow. In diastole, you get a diastolic flow. And then when the atrium contract, you get what we call an atrial reversal. So this is your classic hepatic vein flow. Systolic component, a diastolic component, an atrial reversal component. And the normal scenario, systolic component, is a little bit greater than the diastolic component. It's below the baseline because the flow is away from the transducer. Okay. When we talk about tissue Doppler, all we do, your apical four, four chamber view, we put that we can put Doppler at the, 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 the septum, or we can put the Doppler in the lateral wall. Very important. You just put it at the, the you put it on the muscle, okay? Either the septum or the the lateral wall, and you want to see the the velocity of that muscle, okay? And these are the the, the, the spectral display you have down here. Remember the transducer is right there. Transducer is right up here. In systole, this septum actually moves up towards the transducer. So it inscribes what we call an S prime or an S wave, okay? S prime, okay? Because in systole, the ECG is right there, systole is from onset of the QRS to the end of the T wave. In systole, your septum moves up towards the transducer. In diastole, it moves down. It moves away from the transducer. So in systole, you get your S wave. In diastole, you actually get two components. You have a what we call your E prime and your A prime. E prime, A prime. Okay? Because in diastole, the muscle moves away from the transducer. So it's going to be below the baseline. So you get an E prime and an A prime. When we look at pulmonary vein flow, and these are very, these are, when you're doing echo, these Doppler is crucial for you to make your diagnosis. They are extremely important for you to make proper assessments. You have to know how to do them, and you have to know how to interpret them. Okay, so your apical four chamber view, your probe is your probe or transducer is right there. Cursor is right here. It's the the, the the sample volume is in the pulmonary vein, the right upper pulmonary vein, which is right there. And you just press your P doubler, pulse wave doppler button. You're gonna get a systolic component, you're gonna get a diastolic component, and an atrial reversal. Because when blood flow into the pulmonary vein, the pulmonary vein drains into the left atrium, the blood is flowing towards the transducer. So pulmonary veins are right there, right there. The blood is actually flowing towards the transducer. Hence, you're going to get the Doppler spectral envelope above the, waist, the baseline, above the baseline. But when the atrium contracts, it's going to push blood in the opposite direction. And that is why the atrial reversal is going to be below the baseline. Okay? Blood flowing towards the transducer is going to 
give you a spectral envelope above the baseline, blood flowing away from the transducer is going to give you a spectral envelope below the baseline. The normal pulmonary vein flow, the systolic component, is a little bit greater than the diastolic component. Okay, very important. Tricuspid uh, inflow. So, for chamber view, this is your left ventricle here, left ventricle, ventricular septum. This is the right ventricle, tricuspid valve, right atrium. Your cursor is right there. Sample volume is right there. In diastole, in diastole, blood is going to flow from the right atrium across the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. So you're going to get Okay, it's going to be similar to your mitral inflow, but the, the, the velocity is going to, it will be less. You're going to get your, your IVRT, you're going to get your E velocity, your diastasis, and A velocity. You're going to get all those things, but the velocity is usually less. So, pulse wave Doppler is limited by its inability to measure high blood flow velocities. It cannot measure high blood flow velocity, okay? If you have high velocities, you're gonna get something that we call aliasing. Aliasing will occur at velocities above 1.5 to 2 meters per second. What that means, it, it's gonna cut off, when, once it's reached at 1.5, two meters per second, it's going to cut off that velocity and it's going to put it in the opposite direction. That's what we call aliasing. So aliasing is represented on the spectral trace as a cutoff of a given velocity. Once it reaches the maximum limit of the pulse wave Doppler, it's going to cut it off. And it looks like this. So if we were looking, this is, this is actually, um, aortic insufficiency, aortic insufficiency. And aortic insufficiency, you can get, say, four meters per second. The velocity can be, say, four meters per second. So if, this, if, 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 if you're looking at aortic insufficiency and you use a pulse wave Doppler signal to, to evaluate that, once you get to 1.52, it's going to cut off the top and put it down the bottom because it cannot assess velocities greater than 1.5 to 2 meters per second. But once you change from PW to CW, it will give you the full envelope, okay? So pulse wave Doppler can only measure lower velocity uh, signals. So if you have a higher velocity, you have to move on to continuous wave Doppler. So continuous wave Doppler measures blood flow velocity along the entire line of interrogation. The transducer is continuously sending out impulse of uh, ultrasound and continuously listening. Remember this pulse wave sends out and then wait, sends out and wait. The continuous wave, if you're using a transducer in a continuous wave uh, Doppler mode, it's continuous, it's sending out impulse and continuous listening for the reflected frequency uh, shift coming back. So it's sending and receiving at all times. So it can measure higher velocities. So when you have higher velocity uh, signals, such as mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, aortic insufficiency, you have to move to continuous wave Doppler. So two dimensional echo is on top. Your transducer is right there. Your cursor is across the mitral valve. You have blood flowing from the left ventricle across the mitral valve into the left atrium. This is what we call mitral regurgitation. Mitral regurgitation. Blood is flowing from the left ventricle across the mitral valve into the left atrium. 
So it's moving away from the transducer. Hence, you're going to get these envelopes in systole below the baseline, below the baseline. Okay? So you get systolic envelope, which is below the baseline, because the flow is moving from the left ventricle into the left atrium, away from the transducer. It's high velocity, usually of the heart of five meters per second or more. So you can't use pulse wave Doppler. You will get anything. So you use your continuous wave Doppler. Remember, systole is from the onset of the QRS to the end of the T wave. So you get these systolic flow, mitral regurgitation. And similarly, tricuspid regurgitation. Remember, we looked at this before. Okay, two-dimensional echo, short axis at the level of the aorta, transduces right there, tricuspid valve, curses across the tricuspid valve. You have a flow from the right ventricle across the tricuspid valve into the right atrium. It's moving away from the, the, the transducer, and it's below the baseline, below the baseline, and it's a systolic flow classic tricuspid regurgitation. The velocities of the heart are three meters per second, so you can't use pulse wave Doppler. You have to move on to continuous wave Doppler. Once the velocity is above 1.5 to two meters per second, you have to use continuous wave Doppler, okay? If the patient has aortic stenosis, okay? So this is the two-dimensional echo up top. Your transducer is right there. And the curse is across the aortic valve. Your sample volume is in the aortic valve. And you turn your CW button on. You get this flow. You get this flow. OK? which is across the aortic valve. And the reason why the velocity is increased is because the aortic valve is narrow. So just like you have a hose and you, you, you narrow the nozzle of the hose, the, 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 it's, it's gonna, the velocity is gonna, the velocity is gonna be increased. And it's the same, same thing you're getting. Increased velocity across the aortic valve because the aortic valve is narrowed. The velocities of the other, close to four meters per second. So you can't use uh, PW there, okay? You also have some aortic insufficiency, which is a diastolic, okay? So if diastole is from the end of the T wave to the QRS, end of the T wave QRS. So you see you have this repeated diastolic flow across the aortic valve, which is what we call aortic insufficiency or aortic regurgitation, okay? So we're going to move on now to, to color flow Doppler. At the beginning of the lecture, we said that color flow Doppler is a form of pulse wave Doppler. So color flow Doppler is a form of pulse wave Doppler. So the returning echoes is displayed as an assigned color. So we if 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 the if there's fl the flow towards the transducer, we're gonna assign that a color. Flow away from the transducer, we're gonna assign that another color or a different color. So it's customary if there's blood flowing towards the transducer, we give it uh, we color code it red. So if you see any red color, it suggests that the blood is flowing towards the transducer. And if you see any type of blue color, it suggests that there's flow away from the transducer, okay? So flow towards the transducer are seen as shades of red. Flow away from the transducer are seen as shades of blue. So red towards the transducer, blue away, okay? And then turbulence. 
turbulence is seen as a, a mixture of the colors. So we, took, we call it a mosaic of the many colors. Okay, so areas where you will have turbulence if you have regurgitation. If you have regurgitation, you'll get turbulence. If you have obstruction, stenosis, you can also get turbulence. The blood is not, you don't have that nice laminar flow. You have speeding up and slow down. So, you know, you have turbulence, a mixture of the colors. No flow is seen as black. Faster, faster velocities are displayed in brighter shades of red or blue. Okay. All right. So let's look at this scenario. Your transducer or probe is right there. If you look at this, okay. So blood usually flow from the left ventricle across the left ventricle flow track, across the aortic valve, and into the aorta. So it's actually moving towards the transducer. The, the aorta sort of curves like that. So blood is moving towards the transducer. So you'll get this red uh, coloration, tell you that the blood is moving towards the transducer, which is right there. And then this is actually mitral regurgitation, the mitral valve right there, and you get this mosaic color but it's uh, probably mainly blue. Your transducer is right there, and this flow is moving away from the transducer somewhat. And then short axis at the level of the aorta. Tricuspid valve is right there, right ventricle, right atrium. We get this mosaic. This is what we call the mosaic. It's a mixture of the color, suggesting turbulence, OK? And the, the flow is actually moving from the right ventricle across the tricuspid valve into the right atrium. If you have aortic insufficiency, aortic regurgitation, transducer is right there. Blood is moving from, from the aorta, going across the aortic valve across the left ventricle flow track back into the left ventricle. It's moving away from the transducer. So when you look at uh, aortic regurgitation or aortic insufficiency, it's going to be shades of blue. If you have a lot of turbulence, then it's going to be mosaic. But it's moving away from the transducer. Transducer is right there. So flow towards the transducer will be shades of red, flow away from the transducer will be shades of blue. And you have to remember that. You can't do anything else in echo unless you have a, a clear understanding of Doppler. Doppler is the basis of everything in echo. So you have to go over it, and you have to fully understand everything about Doppler, OK? And you, know, you have to remember flow towards the transducer. You're going to get an envelope above the baseline, flow away from the transducer, envelope below the baseline. You have to know when to use P doubler, low velocity, know when to use C doubler, high velocities, okay? And know the different uh, shades of color in your, uh, in your color flow. It appeared that color flow, those of you who are doing exams soon, you have to know everything about color. They're gonna ask you that. And one of the things they're going to ask you, if you have uh, increased velocity, what, what it's going to look like, you know, varying shades of blue. And you have to, you know, so you have to know everything. Up. They're going to go ask you a, a lot of questions about color flow Doppler, okay? They're going to check your knowledge, make sure you understand everything about color flow Doppler. Remember, it's a P doubler. It's a P doubler, pulse wave Doppler. If you need I velocities, you have to move on to your continuous wave Doppler. Aliasing will occur if you use your P doubler to measure high velocities. Aliasing is just a cutoff because you can only measure up to about 1.52 meters per second. And then it's going to cut off, cut off the remainder and put it in the opposite direction. Okay? So you have to go over Doppler 
especially for people who are doing the exam, you're going to get a bunch of questions on Doppler. They always give you a bunch of questions. And another question is, is, is about the angle, angle theater. You, you, your echo is invalid if your angle theater is more than 20 degrees. You, 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 know, you have to try and get that angle theater close to zero. Ultrasound beam should be parallel to flow as much as possible. Okay, you get maximum velocity if it's if your angle theater is close to zero. Remember that Doppler. One of the limitation of Doppler is it's angle dependent. That's one of the limitation of Doppler. It's angle dependent. So you give me a poor study, I'm going to give a poor uh, report. That's essentially what it is. So it's very important to do it accurately. It's not just putting the probe on and getting something that looks like what you're supposed to get. That that you know you'll mess up the diagnosis if you do that. Okay, you have to when whenever you're doing Doppler multiple windows because you want to get the maximum velocity. Okay, so we're going to. Um, 